Hello everyone, um, a bit of a different format of the video today and that's because I wanted to show you something that I've been working on. There is no denying we are living in sort of a hype bubble when it comes to AI right now and it's because of all of these announcements from Google about Gemini and then ChatGPT has been improving as well. Every time this happens people start claiming that we've found general intelligence and that machines are taking over but the way I like to approach this whole hype bubble is I want to see for myself how capable these new models are for helping me in my everyday tasks and things that I do as a software engineer, which is mostly writing code. And the way I do it is basically every couple of months I try to create a project from scratch using as much AI as I can to really understand what I can get out of these new tools. And a couple of months ago I did one and a couple of days ago I did another. And when I work on these projects, I don't really cherry pick the ideas that I know for sure will work well with AI, as they do in the demos, but instead I try to make something that is useful for me. And this time around, I chose to create sort of a payments backend. I work on a number of different apps right now, and all of them are basically free, but someday in the future I do hope that they will be financially sustainable for me. And a prerequisite for that is to be able to distinguish between free and premium features so that I can actually charge for those premium features. And the payments backend is essentially going to be the central part, the central component that all of these apps are going to talk to in order to determine which features the user has access to. And so before we jump into the project, I want to say that I spent a couple of hours trying to code up this backend from scratch using ChatGPT4 and I learned a couple of very interesting interesting lessons that I didn't really see people mention in the demos or in those examples that are meant to hype up things and like news and stuff and I would like to share them with you because I think they would be useful if you're considering using those AI tools to help you out in your work. Before we start I prepared like a little diagram to show what the app is all about and how it's all going to connect so let's jump over to the screen sharing and let me show you what I have. So here is a little sequence diagram that I created and it goes from from top to bottom and left to right. And it all starts with the user wanting to use one of the premium features. What happens is basically the app will check if this feature is a premium feature and whether the user has already bought it. If no, the app will actually take the user over to the product page where the user can purchase the product and obtain that feature. So when that happens, the application will send the current user ID over to the payment processor and the payment processor is basically like a software as a service platform that will host these product pages and will actually process the transactions as they go through. There are many payment processors. There is Stripe, which most people know about. There is Recurly, there is also Paddle, but I'm using something called Lemon Squeezy. And it's very similar to all of those that I listed, but let me show you in the dashboard what it actually looks like. So over here in my Lemon Squeezy dashboard, you can see my only product so far, which is the Productivity Notion template that I have. And if I open it up, you can see that in the details, I can basically put in the name, the description, and most importantly, how the user is going to pay for it. So it can be single payment, subscription, lead magnet, which is basically free, and pay what you want. And what's curious about this product is that I actually set the price to be pay what you want, including zero, and I still made like $600, which is kind of crazy to me. But it doesn't matter, let's keep going. So when the user actually buys the product, the payment processor, in this case Lemon Squeezy, will generate a webhook containing the user ID and a product ID that the user just purchased. And the webhook is simply a web request that is going to be sent over to my payments backend. And this is the project that I wanted to work on together with ChatGPT. Now the payment backend actually has two purposes. The first one is to take in those webhooks, process them as they come in, and then build the state of which features each user has access to based on what they purchased. And the second purpose is to provide a list of features given a user ID to the app when the app wants to check which features the user has. And so here in the diagram you can see that when you purchase something the features from the offer are copied over into the purchase object. And then finally you can see here in the diagram that the app can actually request a list of features from the payments backend and 
the payments backend will respond with the list of active features. Okay, so now we covered what the backend is supposed to do. And before we jump into the chat GPT conversation and discuss all the details there, I just want to give a quick shout out to my sponsor Squarespace because they provide me with an amazing tool to host my landing pages for this particular app. So here's the landing page that I built for my app. And you can see I put a download button here because obviously the payments backend is not live yet. But once it is, I'll be able to put a pricing page and maybe something interesting here to show that will eventually redirect to Lemon Squeezy. But all in all, it was very easy to design this page. It's all drag and drop. And even though I could code this up from scratch, I didn't want to waste any time like centering divs or anything like that because making my app and all these features was kind of more important to me. Now, apart from that, there is a lot of templates that you can use on Squarespace that will help you get started with design if you don't really have design experience. And all you really need to do is customize any of them to your liking, and it's going to be super easy to deploy your website. So if you use the link in the description, you can get 10% off of Squarespace. So check it out. All right, now let's jump into the chat GPT conversation. And let me show you how I was actually prompting it to help me generate the code for this entire project. So here is that conversation that I have and you can see that I started with explaining the simple things that I want to do. For example, I mentioned that I want to use Lemon Squeezy and I gave a little bit of a detail of what it is and things what I want to achieve. I want to point out one thing that I wanted to try with this project that I didn't do last time and that is to provide links to the documentation directly in Lemon Squeezy. And by doing so, I was hoping that I wouldn't have to explain in great detail how the Lemon Squeezy API looks like and what the documentation says. So I was hoping that ChatGPT will be able to just internalize that information and then just use it later. And the first funny thing that I noticed that if you paste more than one link in the same prompt, ChatGPT for some reason will only pay attention to the first one. So I actually had to paste the second link again. But all in all, it was going okay. However, this entire approach with pasting links directly into the chat is a bit of a double-edged sword, and I will come back to this with more detail later when we cover the code parts. But for now, let's just keep going. So here you can see that I pasted the link for the second time, and then you know ChatGPT is going to reasonably summarize what the link says, and it's fine. And then we arrive at the main prompt of the entire project. And this is the one that I used to explain to ChatGPT what I explained to you earlier about the purchase and the offer and how they relate to each other. I would like to point out that actually I spent quite a bit of time composing this prompt. It took me probably 25 to 30 minutes just to narrow down my long prompt into a few paragraphs. I think I have like six paragraphs here so that there is minimal amount of text so that I don't waste the context and yet all of the information is present. It also took me a lot of time because I was making sure that I don't leave any ambiguities in my prompt. And my personal impression is that given how much effort it took me, and I'm a software engineer with like 10 plus years of experience, I think it would be very difficult for someone who doesn't have engineering training to come up with a precise prompt like that so that later you can get the results that I was able to get. But for now, let's just keep going. So after I was able to write this prompt, ChatGPT actually summarized all of my requirements and that gave me a lot more confidence to sort of continue with this conversation because I was starting to see that ChatGPT is sort of getting what I'm trying to do. So let's just follow through and see how it goes. I added here one more requirement to sort of allow features to expire, but it wasn't really problematic for ChatGPT to understand, so I will just skip ahead. The next part is when I started talking about the high level requirements about the implementation itself. I just mentioned that I wanted to use Firestore as my database and Firebase for authentication just to make sure that ChatGPT is sort of getting into the context that I want it to be in so that later when we start talking about the code, it's able to start suggesting ideas that are relevant for my use case. So then from there, ChatGPT was able to kind of summarize the basic steps, but I didn't really want to go into that too much. What's important is that I asked ChatGPT to come up with a data model, and I was really hoping that it would now do a really good job because otherwise if it messed up this one it would indicate that it didn't really understand my requirements at all but thankfully ChatGPT was actually able to come up with a very reasonable data model that was reflecting all of my requirements and that gave me even more confidence.
confidence. So here's the data model that it came up with. We have the users collection, the offers collection, the purchases and the features, which kind of sort of is in the area that I was looking for. So from there, I just started prompting it to give me a little bit more code. And here is the first implementation that it gave me because what we are doing here is we are processing each webhook and some of the basic steps are to verify the signature and all of those things. So it was now time to get into those details and see if ChatGPT is able to determine how to verify the signature and all of those things based on the lemon squeezy documentation. This was a very critical part of the whole conversation. You know, ChatGPT actually has a bit of an annoying tendency to give you an abbreviated version of the code. For example, right here, it gave me just a commented out function how to verify the lemon squeezy signature. But I knew for for a fact that it has all the information, so I just kept pushing it to give me the actual implementation. And after a little bit of back and forth, it was actually able to give me this implementation right here, which I think is very close to what I have in the final version. So if I go over to the final version, the webhook handler, yeah, those two functions are pretty much the same. I think I just remove a few things here just make it more compact, but that's basically the same code. Now, moving forward, it was actually time to sort of start processing different events that we can get from a lemon squeezy webhook. And I was very pleased that it was able to generate a very long switch statement like this one right here, explaining that for each separate event, we're gonna implement a separate function. And that was very clean code in my opinion, so I was happy with that. So moving on, it was time to implement each and every one of those, and so we started started with order created and we did a little bit of back and forth but eventually we did arrive at something that looked kind of useful and so here is the last version it's very very close as you can see to what I had in the chat GPT conversation I think this is just a few things that I had to change for example the user ID was added here but other than that it was pretty good and then moving on from there I actually had a lot more success with the subsequent event types because they are very similar and chat GPT didn't really require require a lot of back and forth because it understood the main differences between order and subscription. So I was quite happy with that and we just pushed forward and I basically copy pasted all of these other ones. So let me show you. So I have subscription created, I have order refunded, subscription updated. Those are pretty much as they were in the chat, so I was pretty happy with that. And now that we had all of these event handlers implemented, it was time to start working on that API endpoint that will give you a list of active features for a given user ID. And this is where I started to see ChatGPT get a little bit confused. And let me explain, let me give you a little bit of context as to why I think this is happening. And I want to get back to that point that I made about pasting links into your chat. So what I did is I pasted links for lemon squeezy documentation, and what happened happened there is that they don't really have a concept of a user. For example, everybody that purchases something on a product page in Lemon Squeezy is a customer. However, they sometimes refer to them as users in the documentation. And in my code, that was creating a bit of a confusion. Let me show you. So here, when we are trying to actually compile a list of features based on the purchases of the current user, we need to query all the purchase documents based on the user ID. However, here, ChatGPT was actually mixing the meaning of customer ID and user ID. And this is not because of something that I wrote, because I was very careful not to write such ambiguities in my prompts. But I didn't have any control over the text in the lemon squeezy documentation. And from there, there must have been a sentence or two that refer to users and customers in pretty much equal way. And from there, ChatGPT concluded that a customer and a user must be the same. And conceptually, they are the same. However, in my system, there is no such thing as a customer ID, at least not in this context. And I only had the user ID because the app only knows about the user. And so if we look at the query that the ChatGPT made, it was wrong, but conceptually it was right. And this is where the confusion really is. But let me expand on this point a little bit more because I was thinking about this very hard. And in the beginning, I created this offer abstraction to keep track of the product ID and the feature set that you can obtain by purchasing that product because I didn't really wanna depend so heavily on the features of the Lemon Squeezy platform because I figured 
Maybe if in the future I don't like Lemon Squeezy as a payment provider, I can switch to another one, as long as I keep the number of features in Lemon Squeezy that I depend on to a bare minimum. And I figured a product must be a feature in all of those payment providers. However, I wasn't really sure about product variants and all of those details that maybe Lemon Squeezy has that could facilitate my offer without me having to recreate it that maybe wouldn't be present in, for example, Stripe. There was a way to sort of try and get ChatGPT to come up with this abstraction that I have for offer. For example, I could have pasted links for Stripe documentation, Recurly documentation, Paddle documentation alongside Lemon Squeezy documentation links and ask ChatGPT to be like, hey, can you please come up with an abstraction that will work for all of these payment providers? However, had I done that, I have a sneaking suspicion that ChatGPT would get super confused because in all of those documentation pages, it is very likely that they use the same words in slightly different meanings. Like they would use product in one way and they would use subscription in another way. And maybe those definitions would be conflicting between Recurly and Stripe. And maybe product would be something else in those two platforms. And so when it came time to actually generate, for example, a database query, my impression is that ChatGPT would have a very hard time determining which attributes to query for. Because even now when I pasted only one link, the fact that I didn't have control over the text that was behind that link resulted in a lot of confusion here in my code. And this is why I mentioned in the beginning that pasting links directly into your chat from sources that you don't really have control over is a little bit of a double edged sword. After that, I had to actually repeat a couple of times in my chat in my conversation with ChatGPT over here that, you know, customer ID and user ID are not the same. And even then, in the next suggested version, ChatGPT made the same mistake again. And so after a couple of more corrections, actually ChatGPT was able to generate the correct query. So from there, we actually just proceeded to finalize the code. And I even asked it to generate the tests for my functions. And because I spent a little bit more time on the first test, which I will show you right now, ChatGPT was actually able to expand on that idea and generate the tests for all of the other event handlers in a similar fashion. And this is where I started to see again that it actually does pay off if you spend a little bit of time on the first example to really illustrate what is it that you're trying to do because later ChatGPT will be able to generate code that is very very close to the final version if not easily copy pastable directly into your code base. And so here I've spent a little bit of time to actually discuss the mocking for example here with the mocks for the Firebase, as well as the documents that we want to check later. But if you look at the other tests, they pretty much have the exact same structure. And this was generated by ChatGPT pretty much verbatim, as you can see it right here. Now, I don't really want to go into too much detail about that, not to repeat myself too much, but I will open source the code for this exact code base, as well as the conversation that I had with ChatGPT with all the prompts and all the results. So maybe you can take a look at it for yourself and let me know what are you your impressions. What do you think? Did you maybe have a similar experience with ChatGPT that led you to believe that we have reached uh, general intelligence maybe? Or maybe you haven't. I'm mainly uh, looking at this from the point of view for coding, but if you're working on something else and if you're finding some interesting results, please share them in the comments. And if you like this video, if it was useful to you, make sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.